welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you. In your 18 years as CEO of Volters Kluwer, you transformed the company from a print publisher to an electronic service provider. A true digital transformation. You are listed among the best CEOs in the world and you tenfolded the stock price from $10 to over $100 in your time. According to various prestigious lists, Volters Kluwer is leading in diversity and you launched an ambitious sustainability program. These are all the main topics of our time and they all require transformations. I would like to talk with you about some of the highlights of these transformations as an inspiration for other change leaders who are on a different phase in their journey. Let's dive right in uh, the first topic, a very important topic, and that is diversity, your transformation to diversity leader. My first question would be, how would you define diversity? For us at Walters Kluwer, it really means having a uh, diverse population of employees, not just around gender diversity, which I think is more how people uh, uh, see the word, but really around nationality diversity, uh, ethnic diversity, uh, racial uh, diversity. So we try and have you know, more or less a melting pot of people come together. And part of that happened organically in the sense that, you know, we have 220 plus offices around the world. We are very local in many of our markets. And so those businesses are run by local nationals. And so we've always had a very broad representation, you know, sort of from a global perspective. I think on the gender side, um, you know, really in the beginning, it happened very organically where we needed so much new talent in the business to, to get the transformation, you know, moving that we just sort of started to hire different kinds of people, different, you know, a lot of technical uh, skills. And as a result of that, it, it sort of acted a bit as a catalyst to then starting to see the pipeline fill of diversity. And my strong belief is that in order to get diverse talent at the top of an organization, you have to have a strong pipeline. Uh, and so we really started then to focus very much on the middle management within the company, making sure that was very diverse such that as a result, when and when promotions emerged, we now have you know, sort of a 50% uh, female representation at many levels. A little tougher in tech. I have to say that's where we have under 50%. That's an area we're working on. But in general, you know, we have a fairly uh, broad, diverse population. Exactly, yes. And why do you think it is so important, diversity? Yeah, again, this was really my own experience during the transformation, particularly in the early years, where the most diverse teams were the most creative and innovative and, innovative and had the best results on almost every dimension, you know, not just financial uh, results, but customer feedback was very high, employee engagement was high. So all of the elements that you measure a business around diversity, you know, was highly correlated with that. So it made a lot of business sense to just continue to strive for diversity. And what, what we found is over time, it really is this flywheel where, uh, you know, meaning that it starts to promote itself, where people will get attracted to Walter's floor because it's diverse and they can see the opportunities for themselves. And it just starts to, you know, you have to pay attention to it, of course, but it really starts to take off once you get a critical mass of diversity. And again, not just gender diversity, but, but other, uh, you know, ethnic diverse, diversity, racial diversity, et cetera. Yeah. And I think you also said somewhere in an interview that besides... The, that the teams just come with better results. It also represents your customers. Also in that sense, Absolutely. it's really logical. Yeah. Yes, in fact, if you look at, you know, particularly in legal uh, and health and tax, you know, there's a fair, you know, amount of female representation in all of those professions, less so in financial services. And so, you know, that that is, you know, often you're sitting across the table from people that, that have common, uh, you know, share common characteristics with our employees. So again, it sort of perpetuates itself as you as you really get to that critical mass. Yeah, yeah. no, that's really good to hear. Then to take the step from the diversity and inclusion to the digital transformation, yeah. where of yeah. course you have the unique experience of an 18 year 
digital transformation time. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to start at the basics here because maybe for those who don't know what Walter Skluwer does, uh, yeah. who are your customers and what are their needs? Yeah. Because I know you're always very customer focused. Yeah, so our customers are professionals in health, tax, legal, financial services. And the common, you know, kind of component across, because obviously they, they perform different uh, functions, but the common issues that they face or challenges that they face really have been consistent over the last 18 years. They've become more accelerated, uh, but, but really consistent. And the first is that they really struggle to keep up to date with new developments. And so the amount of information is just, you know, overwhelming at this point. And they need help kind of separating what's important from what's not important. They need help to comply with the rules and regulations. Uh, and we, that is our area of expertise. So if you go back, you know, in the history of the business from the 1800s to today, what we have always been known for is our expertise and our ability to curate, you know, vast and complex information and make it digestible for our customers. And so that's the core challenge that they face. The second core challenge, which I, I would say really emerged in the, in the 18 years I've been uh, the CEO, is around uh, the need to do more with fewer resources. And I think that's something that every executive uh, and every business person can relate to. And so that focus on productivity became really pronounced as the internet took hold. And so if you look today, you know, our focus on expert solutions, uh, these solutions are really productivity tools. And so we, we kind of got to this place very much in part from our customers. So our customers, you know, perform mission critical work in their various uh, areas, and we assist them in that, you know, with information and with tools. Yeah. And could you give an example, for example, in the health area for a doctor? What, what do you provide? Yeah. So one of our core uh, sort of flagship brands is a product called UpToDate. And UpToDate is used by over 1.3 million healthcare providers around the world. And what it is, is it a clinical decision support tool. So it's obviously digital, uh, available you know, online, on your phone, everywhere. And what, the, what it helps the, the doctor or the nurse do is very quickly look up you know, a patient's symptoms, a, a, an issue that the patient is bringing for them. And it quickly helps them figure out what the diagnosis might be and then how to treat it. So we have documented and proven that hospitals that use up to date have better patient outcomes than, than those that don't. So it's very much, I mean, if you look at the usage statistics, many of our customers are using it 20, 30 times a day. So, you know, you know, pretty much with every patient encounter, they're kind of looking up something. It could be as something as simple as a drug dose. You know, they want to write a prescription and they have to know what the dosage is. They, they look it up based on the patient's characteristics, things like that. that really help them, you know, get to the right uh, diagnosis and also the right treatment. Yeah. No, I can imagine that becomes even much more important these days. Yeah. 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 And um, now if we talk about the transformation journey, could you point out where there, you know, if you would have to divide it in different phases, yeah. what would they yeah. be? At Walter Square, we have a three-year plan. So we have a rolling three-year plan. Um, and, and we do that as a way to constantly keep everyone focused on the key priorities. So if I take, you know, the first six to say 10 years, particularly the first six years, that was really the period of major transformation. And when I came on board as CEO, I would say we had a burning platform at Walter Clore. You know, the company was not growing. It was struggling financially. And, and it was because we had been late to the internet. And, and as a result of that, we had to move quickly. Otherwise, I think there was real question uh, in many people's minds about could we have stayed independent if we didn't, you know, successfully transform. So in the first sort of, you know, first two plans, so six years, what did we do? We did three things that have turned out, you know, again, in hindsight to be absolutely critical. The first was to make many portfolio changes. You know, the prior strategy had been an acquisition led strategy. So we had acquired, you know, probably 300 businesses over, say, 20 years. And a lot of the businesses weren't core. So we shed a lot of assets. 
We also bought uh, assets that represented the future, so digital assets to strengthen our core positions. So that those portfolio changes were absolutely essential to creating the market positions we have today. The second critical factor was reinvestment. We did not have a track record of product innovation. Uh, you know, we had again mostly acquired our innovation, and so we really needed to reinvest in the core. So we started a plan, which we still deploy today, of reinvesting eight to ten percent of our revenues back in new and enhanced products. And that has that is sort of sacrosanct at the company. We've we've held that investment even during periods like the global financial crisis or the pandemic, because we recognize how critical it is to have that continuous stream of new and enhanced products. So that was priority uh, two. And then, of course, the, the third uh, uh, area that was very critical was talent. So we at the time, we didn't have a lot of digital skills and technology skills. And so it's interesting today, our largest group of employees are technical people. And back in you know 2003, we had very few. And so that talent transformation was also pretty critical. So that was really, you know, the first sort of two, you know, plans. So six years, very, what I would call very heavy lift in the sense that required a lot of hard work on everybody's part to kind of get the transformation happening. And then sort of the second phase was really around, you know, solidifying the, 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 the product quality and beginning the transformation around expert solutions. So we had to become you know, not just a digital provider, but a provider of the best digital products. So today we have the best products in the market. We measure net promoter scores, which is a way to judge are your customers really satisfied with your products. And we, you know, we set out a goal that we would have, you know, very high net promoter scores relative to competition. So that second phase was around, you know, high quality digital products, beginning to build out the expert solutions that that our customers need in the marketplace and then really uh, you know kind of professionalizing our sales and marketing uh, you know we had been a very product centric company you know we obviously did have sales and marketing efforts but it was not at the level it needed to be in order to uh, to get us you know fit for the future so that was the second phase of the transformation and then today, uh, you know, the company's never been in better shape than it is uh, today. And and today it's all about really accelerating uh, the growth of expert solutions, uh, driving cloud adoption, and again, driving, you know, a lot more around digital marketing, because uh, that really represents sort of the future of how, how we'll interact with our customers. So I would say the first, you know, six to 10 years were the toughest, right? It's yeah. because... Because when you start a transformation, what, what, what our experience was, and I think it's pretty common, is there's a lot of disbelief in the beginning. You know, people don't see the results. And this was true for even, you know, for years because we're a recurring model. So you don't often see in the financial results that it's succeeding. So it really requires this incredibly strong commitment on part of, uh, you know, the team to believe in what we're doing, even when it's hard for others to see that it's working. And so I was very fortunate to work with a group of people that had that belief. And, you know, we sort of stuck with it. And then, you know, obviously, uh, you know, over time, you begin to see, yes, it's working. So the first, you know, the first few years are, are the toughest because you don't see yet uh, you know, kind of the success in the financial results. Yeah, exactly. And you say to deep dive a bit on that uh, period uh, and to start with your with your last comment on you are lucky enough to have a team. I'm, I'm not sure you were only lucky. I'm sure yeah. something else happened. So I'm, I'm really interested. How did you get your, the shareholders along? While, as you said, the financial results were pretty flat, six to 10 years. Yeah. And you invested... An enormous amount of money. Yeah, it, it required a huge amount of work, uh, again, uh, to, to, to make that happen. And it starts with being very clear on where you're going with the business, right? People need to, you know, not just shareholders, but employees and customers need to know where are you taking the business. So we spent a lot of time on, you know, developing the strategy, making it extremely clear 
uh, to people, setting expectations. That was a big part of, of any transformation. You have to be clear on where are you going? What are you going to do to get there? And then how long it's going to take to get there? And then, of course, what are the benefits, not just again for shareholders, but customers and employees? So it took a lot of effort to continue that very clear you know, communication around, you know, the direction that we were going and then create alignment with the team. So we created, you know, incentives that, 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 that employees received based on achieving the results and, and being very clear on the priorities. Uh, so I would say the, the, the strategy is critical. Execution, of course, is everything because without execution, you don't get the results. But having that very simple strategy with clear priorities was probably very, very key, particularly in the beginning, before you start to see some of the results happen. Yeah. And and you made extreme portfolio changes. I think there were, I think almost, maybe you can share some numbers. Were there almost over 100 acquisitions at that time for billions worth of assets? Yeah, we shed over a billion of euros of revenue and then we bought about a billion or more of, of revenues. And so the goal was to get very strong market positions. And why is that? Is when you actually go out and talk to our customers, what you find is they want fewer suppliers and they want the products to work together. So what that meant is that we needed, you know, to, in order, for example, to go serve the tax and accounting market, we wanted to be in a position to say, we have everything you need from a product perspective to be a successful accountant. And so we needed to make sure we had those products in the portfolio and that required getting rid of some things that were not core, but also acquiring some things. And of course, building things organically to get that strong breath. And, and if you look at that strategy, it, it very much serves us well because one of our biggest opportunities for growth is cross-selling. You know, most people in the industry, we all have very high retention rates. And so if you retain, say, 90% of your customers, and so do your competitors, there's not a lot of switching going on of customers from one supplier to another. So what you really need to be able to do is go out to that customer base and say, I've got some brand new products that, that are really you know, you know, going to help you do your work and, and upsell them. So a big part of the innovation is around having that strong, you know, installed base of customers and then innovating in a way that allows our sales teams to go out and, and continue to upsell and grow the wallet share. So growing wallet share is, is far more significant as a driver of growth than just acquiring new logos. Yeah. Uh, we still need to acquire new logos, but it's a large part around this cross-selling. And that really requires the focus, again, on understanding customer needs and then driving innovation uh, around around what you hear from customers. Yeah. And in that first phase, talking about customers, how did you make sure that you stayed close to customers and made the relevant stuff? Yeah, again, that, that happens, you know, so we do a three-year plan uh, that represents the corporate focus, but then every year within each of our business units, we do a, a rolling annual plan. And in that annual plan, you know, part of the, 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 the goal of all the units is to talk to customers. I mean, we talk to customers every day, our innovation process. So we have a very uh, clear process that all the units follow in terms of how to innovate And in that innovation process, it starts from day one with getting customers working hand in hand with us. So the voice of the customer is really at every stage of, of, of how we conduct business from ideation to, to uh, development, as well as just in our overall strategic thinking, making sure we understand where markets are going. So because we do this rolling annual plan, we always have a lot of information on customers. We look at net promoter scores you know, frequently throughout the year to make sure that, you know, we're staying uh, ahead of competition from a, from a product quality perspective. So we have a lot of ways that we stay close, yeah. close to customers. No, that's extremely important and not everyone does that. Uh, and then I think also you test, uh, you have a process, quite agile process to test yes. uh, products huh, with customers. Yes. So in fact, that's one of the things we did a number of years ago is we moved our software development to an agile process. And we work on 
uh, what we call minimum viable products. So we start ideating uh, early and then we work in two week sprints uh, is what they call in the development world. And then we take it back out to customers, you know, refine it. And so by the time we actually get to launch, you know, it still can be a two to three year process. Don't get me wrong. These products are very complex to build. But by the time we get to launch, not only do we have beta customers, but we also generally have early adopters who are paying already to, to use the product. And so that whole process has allowed us to get more product concepts in the funnel, but to, to rationalize them more quickly. So you don't get all the way to market and then find out you've built something that customers won't pay for. And so that's really was a crucial change you know, during the transformation to get better at innovation. And so one of the questions I often get asked uh, from shareholders is, well, is eight to 10% reinvestment enough? Why not 15%? And the the reason we believe still that eight to 10% reinvestment uh, back in the businesses is enough is that we're getting more, you know, sort of bang for our buck around development. So for every Euro that we're investing now, we're getting more productivity from a development perspective. And that is because of this process that we deployed. And every unit follows that process such that, you know, we can look across the enterprise and kind of have a good sense of where we're driving innovation. Yeah, and that also then means that you don't, uh, that things are being stopped or being killed in those first two, three years yeah. and not being lingered on for years and years. Yeah. That's also what we sometimes yeah. see that pilots start and then they linger on and it's sometimes yeah. difficult to close them again, to stop them. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you're wildly successful on day one, no. but it does mean that um, you definitely lower your failure rate. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's part of, again, getting more productivity out of your development dollars. And so that's been a very important uh, you know, process that we've deployed going back now probably 10 years. Yeah. And also going uh, back to that first phase is... Um, uh, I can imagine that you also got more customer insights because you moved from print to online. Yes. What, what did absolutely. that do to the business? Yeah, that is such a remarkable uh, uh, you know, element of the transformation, which makes it really exciting because in the, in the print world, you'd spend all this time developing a product and you kind of throw it over the wall, so exactly. to speak, and you, but you really didn't even really understand what customers were doing with the product. Mm-hmm. In the digital world, we have tremendous usage st- st- statistics. And so what we can do is not only, you know, from a marketing perspective, figure out certain bundles that customers will likely want to buy because the products are kind of linked together. But very importantly, uh, we use it as a source of innovation. Uh, because, you know, uh, these professions are highly complex professions. So it allows us to to know that, okay, if a lawyer is looking at something in security law in a certain area, they're likely trying to solve, you know, a certain topic. And so we can guide them. We can provide them with more insights. You may want to look at this. You may want to look at that. We can provide them with certain workflow tools. So those used to usage statistics are really critical for getting insights into actually what customers are doing with the products. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's a completely, you know, a huge benefit, right, yeah. from being digital that did not exist in the analog world. Yeah. If we go back to that first phase, what, what we often see with clients is that, for example, uh, then a pilot has been run, you know, it has been a customer test and some internal people have been trained. But then to turn that pilot into something that scales and then it becomes so that it becomes the main activity, you know, of the organization. Could you describe the steps that you have taken? Yeah. So it starts, um, you know, first and foremost by understanding what customers want and what they are willing to pay for. Because sometimes those two things are not always uh, (laughs) the same. And so. In the beginning, you know, we did struggle with digital products, right? We didn't always have the best products. Sometimes the products missed the mark in terms of what they were accomplishing. And so it started very much, you know, really going market segment by market segment, looking at what was our offering, how did it compare with competition? You know, were we gaining, you know, share or not? Uh, Were customers happy with the products or not? And then, 
you know, this is where the hard work comes in, very much setting out what we call product roadmaps. So for all of our products of any, you know, size, we have three year product roadmaps where we have identified the enhancements that we're going to make to continue to improve that product. And, and that has led us to, again, be in a position today with very high quality products in the, the segments that we operate in and very high net promoter scores. But it takes time and it takes a lot of work with your customers. I think the biggest part of the transformation that we, we haven't talked that much about, but it was critical, was we went from a world where people made individual contributions. You know, an editor was working by themselves or maybe with an outside author. We went from that type of environment to a team environment. Today, all the work we do is in a team. So every team, you know, has a representative expert, you know, largely an editorial uh, person, sales or commercial people and developers. And they work together to create the products. And so, again, with customers. And so making that shift was pretty important. And that was very culturally different than, than the world of the past. And, and when did that working in teams start? Yeah, really early on. So I would say sort of within that first three years, we, yeah. we recognized look, we can't just keep acquiring innovation that wasn't working for us. We have to do this organically. So how do we get that done? So what you what we found is people liked working with their colleagues and they liked talking to customers and they liked problem solving, you know, sort of as a team. How many of the people, if you look at the organization, how many people could you, of the original people when you started in 2003, could you take along and maybe retrain? How many did you have to let go? And how many new talents did you attract? Yeah. Yeah, I would say at the, the senior level, so say the top, you know, 500 people, we switched out about 60% of them, you know, did not, you know, either because they didn't have the skill set or they, they didn't align around, you know, where we were headed with business. So, but that occurred pretty early within the first three years. And then, then a lot of the skills was really around as we begin to grow again, you grow, not only grow revenues, but you grow jobs, right? And so as we moved into a growth phase, you know, a lot of the job growth is in development. So technology roles and in sales and marketing. And those have been our fast growing areas. Um, if you look at our experts, you know, that, that population has been very retained and hasn't changed that much because we still require that expertise to build uh, the products. So it really was around technology. So today, about a third of our jobs are technology oriented. Again, that was uh, that was one or two percent back in 2003. So that's been the biggest growth. And then sales, a lot of focus on, on sales and marketing. So that's been also an area of, of job growth at the, biz at yeah. the business. And um, I also think that from the beginning, you invested heavily in your own backbone huh? in terms of infrastructure. I think that also uh, was a good way to centralize certain yes. competencies yeah and uh, facilities, but also keep stuff decentralized at the markets. Yeah. Could you explain a bit about that? Yeah, and again, that was one of the big cultural shifts. You know, we were completely decentralized when I took over, meaning that every unit was investing in technology. So we were duplicating investments, which was not ever going to be a way that you could scale. And so a big part of the early centralization was getting common platforms, common infrastructure, common development, and, and really reining in the investment so that the investments were centralized and we could build out those capabilities, also move some things you know, to outsource providers that had more scale than we did. That was, again, a very big cultural shift for people. And that led to a, a lot of people leaving, you know, because if you were uh, you know, an executive that clearly just wanted to own everything and, and sort of run your own show with no collaboration with anyone else. It wasn't going to be a winning formula going forward. So we, we began that centralization again, largely around technology. And then over time, you know, we've created more central functions. So finance is centralized, HR, you know, technology. What is local is, of course, product development and sales and marketing because we want those functions to be very close to customers. 
We also want our local operations to be run by local nationals because they really understand the market. And so that led to, again, both more diversity because we we engaged uh, at the local levels. And so this this model of local and global is one that you know, is is pretty well mature now at the company. Again, it took a fair amount of work to get us there, but we have a good sense of what what becomes what needs to be global and what needs to stay local, so that we you know satisfy you know customer needs. You already said that um, in that first phase you made huge portfolio changes. Uh, one billion you uh, sold in assets and you bought also one billion in assets. You're, as a second thing, as you said, of that period, you reinvested, but you still do that, 8 to 10 percent in revenue. I also saw that's like 50-50 CAPEX and OPEX, huh? a capital yeah. expenditure and operating expenditure, which I also thought was quite fascinating. Yeah, in the beginning, it was more operate. You know, we we uh, operating expense because we expensed everything right away. The kind of accounting definition is you can only capitalize something when it reaches technical feasibility. So any new innovation is not ever going to get to that standard until you're basically out in the marketplace. Uh, the reason our capex is a bit higher today is a lot of what we're building is cloud. So we're taking our on-premise uh, solutions to the cloud. So they reach technical feasibility very early and therefore we can capitalize. So we tend to think about those two metrics together and add them up, you know, sort of the eight to 10. The other thing we do that really I think was from a process perspective, pretty instrumental is that we, we think about uh, the business from a portfolio perspective. And so what, the, what does that mean? It means that, you know, think about a bell curve. We take our product development and we look at nascent, high growth, mature, and declining. And we take our major products and businesses and we put them in that bell curve. And what you would see is that eight to 10%, while it's the average, in the nascent and the high growth, it's much higher. It's more like 15%. And of course, in the mature and, and of course the declining, it's much lower. So that capital allocation philosophy was very, very critical. And so if you talk to any of our senior managers in the company, I think one of the things that we've embedded in the cultures of, of the company is a focus on capital allocation. There is a finite budget and you have to yeah. spend it. I think in the beginning you had to spend it across print and online. Yeah. And now you have to... Um, divided between the services and products of different maturity, as you say. There's a tendency, right, when you have a budget that you spread the peanut butter, you know, if I can use that expression, right, across all the products and all the businesses, and you try and give a little bit to everything. And that never turns out, to, no one gets enough, right? And so you never have an impact uh, using that philosophy. So by having this strong orientation towards capital allocation and where is the return going to come from, it actually allows us to really, you know, put enough focus uh, behind the, the the bigger opportunities. And that, again, has led to stronger results yeah. around growth and around, uh, around profitability. If you look back at the transformation, would you have done things differently? I would say on the big three things that we did, the portfolio changes, the, uh, the reinvestment and the focus on the core organic innovation and then the enhancement of our talent. I wouldn't change those three things. Those things were very important. I think along the way, there were a few acquisitions we made that didn't turn out to be very helpful. There were, you know, products that were launched that maybe, you know, didn't meet the market. But in the broad, I would say that the focus was the right focus. I think on some of the execution, there's always room for improvement, but I wouldn't look back and say, could we have done it faster? You know, today we still have print customers. And if you had asked me back in 2003, in 2022, would you have print customers? I would have said absolutely not. Yeah. And so these these formats, you know, stay uh, in the market for a long period of time. And, and our goal has got to be that we satisfy customer needs. And so I think it would have been extremely difficult to go faster. And what do you think should be the minimum term of a CEO to do a transformation yeah. like this? Well, you know, the average CEO, I think if you, McKinsey actually does a survey, I think, uh, I don't know if they still do it, but in the past, the average was four years 
which is, I think, too short uh, to do any kind of uh, transformation. So I would say for something at the scale of Walter's Clore, where we had to change literally every aspect of what we do, you know, you need you need at least you know, five to 10 years to get it done. I would say the last eight years have really been about the next transformation. You know, we're in the second phase. The first phase was print to digital. The second phase is digital information to expert solution. And so, you know, if you think about, you know, one transformation, it's probably a decade. Uh, if, if you're changing as much as, as, we, as we needed to. I'm also wondering, of course, the, the good old print business was a very yeah. good margin business, huh? Yeah. And uh, it was, you know, uh, the majority subscription. I think you kept that, 80%. So that is amazing that you know what you're going to earn at the beginning of the year already. Yeah. 80% of your business. And how are, if I can ask it, how right. are your current margins compared to the margins of the print business when you started? Yes. Yeah, so, so this is what I get so excited about and uh, what I talk to employees about and shareholders is that the first transformation, if you, if you really step back and you think about, you know, taking a customer from print products to digital, the profit pools did not get any bigger, right? You literally lifted that customer from one format to another. And in fact, I would argue because you had to invest so significantly in, the, in developing those online skills, that the margins decreased in that in that migration. It had to happen because, you know, you the company wouldn't have survived if we didn't, but it wasn't a margin play per se. If you look at this next transformation, what's really exciting is if you look at expert solution products, when they are at scale, they have significant margins. Why is that? These are critical must-have products that are heavily renewed. So an information product, maybe you renew at sort of a rate of 85, 87%. Uh, you know, an expert solution, you're, you're renewing well above 90%. So as a result of that, you can, uh, uh, you can grow faster. It's also once you have a core uh, expert solution that a customer is using, your ability to upsell and cross-sell much higher. So for all of those reasons, at scale, these expert solutions are have very nice margins. And if you compare them to, to print, um, uh, how They're are they? higher. Yeah. Higher. They're higher. Yeah. yeah. No, they weren't always in the beginning. When you're not at scale, it's not yeah. higher. Yeah. But when you get to that scale, meaning you have a critical mass of customers using the product, they're, they're higher than print. And now the last topic, your transformation to yeah. a sustainability leader. Yes. Because yeah. uh, you have started the program Engage. Yes. Uh, yeah. Maybe you could share some main elements of that program. So we'd say Engage is really about increasing our impact. Yeah. Uh, on on the elements of sustainability that were there, but maybe not, you know, not linked and, and led in, in a certain way. So it's really, I'm very excited about it because it's also a way for employees to feel, again, connected to the company, connected to the communities that they work in. And I think it's important, you know, my sense is that for us as, as business leaders to tackle climate and uh, change, and it's going to require you know, intensive collaboration, right, between business and governments and other, you know, NGOs to kind of really tackle this. I don't think anyone can do it by themselves. And so I think what, what I see around the world is business leaders kind of stepping up and uh, and making yeah. a bigger contribution. And I think that that is absolutely needed. Looking at the future, how do you make sure that you keep on being a, a growth-focused, innovative, fast-learning company? Yeah, it starts with engaged employees. So we spend a lot of time ensuring that the feedback we get from, from our employees around uh, the engagement survey we do, that we uh, tackle those areas where we need to kind of uh, make a uh, change is really exciting. And so I think that keeps that external um, input keeps people very uh, energized around what we're doing. Well, I think the way that you drive this, your energy to make this impact and to engage everyone is the best example. So thank you so much for sharing lots of your insights of your incredible journey and uh, great talking to you and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. I enjoyed it as well. Take care. <laughs> 
You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>